Hello, everybody. I think it's 5.01, and I think we will get started. We've got uh, a number of people here, and I know a number of people may still be joining us. I just want to say hello and a warm welcome to everyone, and we want to thank you for joining us at the inaugural Humanity in Healthcare series. So before we start, I want to step back and, and acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. The Humanity in Healthcare series has been percolating for a number of years. And with our world in a state of flux, we felt the timing was right to create a series that focuses on sharing lived experiences of healthcare professionals, trainees, and patients through storytelling and facilitated conversation. Specifically, we, we had three objectives in mind um, with this series, creating a space for important conversations to highlight the collective humanity that brings meaning and challenge to our work as healthcare providers. Promote a shared and inclusive model for continuing professional development within our healthcare setting that prioritize health of the care team. And lastly and importantly, to recognize and reflect on the structure of healthcare systems and academic institutions to build diverse, equitable, and inclusive healthcare teams. And before I get started, I'd like to briefly introduce the initial members of the planning team, um, bringing perspectives from diverse disciplines and settings. So Damon Dagnoni and myself, Catherine Donnelly as co-chairs, um, Damon from emergency medicine and myself from rehabilitation, um, Ernest Snellgrove Clark, the vice dean and director of nursing, Michael McDonald, chief executive, nursing executive from Health Kingston Health Sciences, and Shana Watson, undergrad program chair from the Department of Family Medicine. And so we envisioned this series as providing and would have loved to all be in the same room here today as we, oh, sorry, these are our disclosures here, <laughs> our formal disclosures. We had envisioned and hoped that we could all be sitting in the same room together and sharing a conversation. Um, but we envisioned this series as providing the opportunity for conversation. And we'll stop at a few points along the way to engage in some discussion. Uh, which will be no small feat with, we're expecting almost 200 people here today. Um, so we encourage you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen here. And, you know, in doing so, taking the time, if, if you'd like to share your own experiences and reflections as you hear um, Damon speaking today and, and see this as a place to, to have a, a collaborative virtual conversation. And we welcome you if you feel comfortable to turn on your screen, um, but understand if you don't feel comfortable or would like to. And so I'd like to present our first inaugural speaker of the series, um, Dr. Damon Dagnoni. Uh, Damon's associate professor at the Queen's University in the Department of Emergency Medicine. He completed his medical training at University of Western and his master's of education from the University of Dundee in Scotland. His impressive research program focuses on competency-based education and he led the competency-based medical education team here at Queen's. He would not want me to focus solely on his impressive clinical and academic achievements. And you will hear more from him today about his, his role, his important role as a father and husband and kind and compassionate human. Damon, I'm gonna pass this over to you. Thanks very much, Catherine. And I, I thought I was uh, so not nervous. Well, not now I, uh, here, we, here we go. Um, so uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, spend the next hour to hour and a half um, with all of you. And, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, Catherine and myself and the, the team have been uh, talking about um, what we're hoping to achieve over uh, in the future and in the, in the time to come. And so it's really a privilege to be the first speaker to try and uh, start us off and start trying to have some of these uh, conversations. And so I'm, I'm going to speak um, uh, right now about uh, Doctor as Person uh, and um, part of my journey along with my, my wife and my family of um, losing my child to cancer and, and trying to come back to medicine. Um, and uh, so what, we, what we'd like to do is, you know, uh, I'm going to speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to take a, a break and have some uh, discussion and reflections, do that again for round two. Um, and then uh, I'll conclude with a, a few last thoughts 
Uh, and then for those of you that can stay from 6 to 6.30, we have that entire time uh, for those who want to uh, stay after the program is uh, formally uh, finished uh, to continue the discussion. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that many of you are able to do that. Okay. Um, one uh, disclosure, I, it's not really a commercial disclosure, uh, but it, it's something is, um, I did write a book through Kindle Direct Publishing. It's self-published, so uh, there's no uh, uh, commercial incentive in this talk, but it, it just is related. And so I didn't want to disclose that. So over the next 45 minutes to hour or more, um, I do want to share with you a glimpse uh, of my journey as a bereaved parent um, and highlight some of those moments of vulnerability, uh, both during my son's illness, but also uh, in particular returning to the practice of emergency medicine and caring for others. Um, and together hoping that we can uh, collectively discuss that, that human element of caring for patients, uh, for all of us as healthcare professionals, trainees, patient advocates, um, and family members. Uh, so, um, so let's start at the start, um, or what I feel as closer to the start. Um, this is my family's Christmas card from 15 years ago. Um, I was at PGY4, so in my fourth of five years of emergency medicine specialty training. Um, I had spent some time in uh, Boston doing some fellowship work and I'd started my master's. I, I think the, the picture captures exactly um, how I felt uh, and where I was in my life. Uh, pretty great. Uh, and I knew it, I, I, I knew it at the time. Um, and uh, six months after that uh, Christmas picture was taken or, or thereabouts, uh, we found ourselves in Disney World. My uh, yeah, in-laws sent uh, us to just the best trip ever uh, to Disney. And, um, and so I'll, I'll, let the do, I'll let the pictures sort of do the communicating here. Um, this is my Callum who was uh, two and a half years old here at Disney World. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty great. He's got toothpaste on his shirt. He's, uh, told us right after this picture that he was fully potty trained and ready to go back outside and feed the duck cheesies. Um, life doesn't get any better than, uh, this photo. Um, two weeks after that picture, that those perfect moments that we shared as a family, uh, this happened. Um, it's a picture of a tsunami. We're, we're the little sailboat down below there. Um, Callum was diagnosed with uh, a brain tumor. Uh, and, um, you know, that is uh, life altering to say the least. I knew th from my medical training, although I was an eMERGE emergency medicine resident uh, and not a neurosurgeon or pediatrician, but um, I had paid attention in medical school and I um, knew right in that moment that uh, a two and a half year old being diagnosed with a brain tumor um, was about as bad as it gets. And so we embarked on a journey where our first principle that Trish and I kind of came together on is that home is wherever we are together. We, um, the day that Callum was diagnosed, we were rushed to Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Later that week, we had, uh, we, Callum had a lengthy neurosurgery to remove the tumor, followed by weeks of um, tests and recovery. We then came home to Kingston for the first three, uh, chemotherapy cycles um, at Kingston General Hospital, um, where we spent of those two months, maybe three days at home total, or Callum spent three days at home um, at our house. Um, and then in between, we also, um, when Trisha or I were not in hospital, 
uh, we were at Ronald McDonald's house uh, when we were in Toronto. So um, after Kingston, we went back to SickKids Hospital for September, October, November for cycles four, five, and six of chemotherapy of escalating dosages um, for which each cycle would require Callum to have a stem cell, autologous stem cell transplant. So he would have to be given back his own blood cells that had been frozen in advance uh, to save his life each time. Um, and so, you know, I, I could probably spend an hour talking about this, what this slide means, or, uh, well, frankly, many of the other slides, but living in the hospital is a very lonely experience. Um, away from the four of us being together, away from family, away from close friends, away from colleagues. Uh, in this day and age with social media, uh, Wi-Fi, internet connectivity, um, we didn't have that back in 2006. Uh, nothing like what we have today. Um, it was it was uh, very tough and lonely on on many levels. Um, and it, you know, a, a couple of emotions, uh, feelings, is that anybody who's lived in the hospital, uh, and those of us who care for people who are in the hospital, no matter what domain of healthcare you're in, you, you know that there's, there's really no privacy. Um, and that's just taken to another level um, when, when your child is there 24 seven. Uh, the constant vulnerability in, in front of all others, um, the uncertainty of what's happening, the, the fear and, and scariness of complications, uh, um, and, and just what the future holds is, is constant. But two things were probably, two, I want to talk about two things that were very difficult. So um, my, my boys are 20 months apart. Um, and for for them to have to be separated um, up front, it wasn't mandated, but as we entered cycles four, five, and six, uh, essentially Callum was on full isolation protocol uh, for those cycles. And maybe two or three days um, within those months, within those cycles, uh, they'd actually be able to be in the same room together. Um, I, I don't think I need to go on about how um, gut-wrenching um, it is to have our, our boys separated from each other. And then to have to explain that as parents. Another thing that was really brutal was um, with the combination of a central IV port in the chest, a high riding G2 in the upper abdomen, um, um, and, and also being um, cautioned uh, from an infectious disease point of view to uh, not hug our child, followed by a mandated no, no touching our child for cycles four, five, and six. It, it just, it just seemed inhumane, and and yet that was the reality that uh, we were faced with. And so, despite all of that hardship and challenge, and there was other hardship and challenge, um, my wife Trisha and I really tried to be. Uh, as present as possible, the live now, do now, be in the moment. Um, we were very aware that these moments might be um, the only moments we get. And so Callum lived in a 12 by 10 foot hospital room. He was uh, too sick to leave bed uh, for most of his uh, chemotherapy cycles. 
And so um, we, we, we played hide and seek um, where Cal hid under the covers, under his pillow, and I would hide in different parts of the room and pretend not to see him. And, um, you know, you can do that with an almost three-year-old. Um, seems ridiculous to do it with a six-year-old, but uh, lots, lots of giggles. Um, and and, and uh, Trisha on her part, um, read and read and read and read, just story after story. And so um, as Trisha and I, we're like passing ships in the night, one of us always being with Ty, one of us always being with Callum at the hospital or at Ronald McDonald. Um, you know, we developed the, the routines that we could uh, within the limitations of what we had. Um, and not to be left out, our Ty, who was almost four, um, was supposed to be starting junior kindergarten in September when we went back to sick kids. Uh, and, uh, Lucky for us, the school around the corner behind Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, around the corner from Sick Kids, happily uh, welcomed Ty into the junior kindergarten class. And so we took Ty's bike and we would ride on his uh, bike with his training wheels uh, through downtown Toronto, through Ryerson campus, uh, on the city streets. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with University Avenue in the morning. Uh, in Toronto. It's a pretty busy spot. Uh, we always got lots of smiles and, and laughs and comments with my four-year-old crossing the, the street on his, on his bike to go to school. Um, uh, because it was important, you know, Callum's not our only child. Uh, he needs love and attention and, and parenting too. And so over time, as I've been alluding to, things got harder. Um, and you can see the difference between Callum and Disney World right before his diagnosis. Uh, and this is a picture after the third of six cycles of chemotherapy before the stem cell transplants. Um, you can't really see in underneath that life jacket that Callum is only 20 pounds. Um, there's very little of him there uh, when it comes to soft tissue. But uh, the remarkable little boy who was ours, um, uh, somehow his, his spirit of happiness and trust uh, in his parents and in the doctors and nurses caring for him uh, continued. To give you a, a sense of, um, the invasiveness of um, treatment for his illness. You know, um, I sort of put this up in front of you here. Um, you get a bit of a, a, a snapshot. Um, at the end of October, first few days of November, we found ourselves in the ICU. And we knew we were, we knew we were losing. Um, and we, we, we knew, although nobody in the ICU, nobody on the team would, would say that um, we had lost. We, Trisha and I knew, um, as parents do, we, we, we saw what was coming and started bracing for it. Um, in the last moments of Callum's life, I had, after 10 days of being in the ICU with Trisha and Callum nonstop, not leaving the second floor of the sick kids. I'd, I'd actually gone to see Ty briefly at Ronald McDonald House. Um, and while I was there, um, Callum's heart stopped. And, and so in the last moments of his life, um, 14, almost 14 years ago now, um, this 30 something year old man was running through traffic uh, to make it back to the sick kids ICU, uh, begging him to wait, which, which he did. Um, and shortly after my arrival, um, it, it, was, it was time to turn everything off. And so on Remembrance Day, um, the day that Cal is the day that Callum died in 2006, as I said, almost 14 years ago now, 
um, uh, seem, seems like a, a pretty special day to many, many people and our veterans and heroes across our country and others that that, that is the day that he died. Um, and just as we go into sort of the first uh, break, um, this is where this is where Trish and I found ourselves, leaving the hospital, packing up at Ronald McDonald House, driving home the next morning without our baby um, at home. And uh, um, but there's there's more to come. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, s stop there and let. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Damon. Her, yeah, thanks so much. You've um, you've taken us through uh, the reality of the the toughest time of a person's life, and you've also left us with hope and possibility and light. And that's an amazing way to think of that journey and the impact that it's had on you as a person, and you as a dad, as as a physician, a parent, and all the rest. And I've been I've been scanning our uh, chat. And at this point, no one has popped in a reflection or a thought, but I, I'm just gonna ask you at this point at the end of sort of our first phase, Damon, if you were to, to want, if we were to end right now and you wanted to leave our audience this evening with one ray of hope, <laughs> um, one ray of possibility of, of what this has created to you as a medical professional, what, what would you give everybody? Um. So the good news is that I have uh, 40 minutes or more of, of hope coming. Um, it's, a, it's a hard spot to sort of pause uh, at the, the deepest part of the abyss. But I, I think the most important uh, takeaway would be that um, the, the, whether we call it users who are the patients and families the the, the lived experience of of patients and families despite our best interests as uh, all of us as healthcare providers we really cannot grasp what it is that uh, patients and parents and family members um, are experiencing despite despite our best intentions. And so I think we always have to be very mindful of the care we give, how we set up systems, how we set up care models um, and making sure that uh, patients and families and advocates and all members of the team uh, are there uh, as we design um, and speak to the experiences. Uh, that, that would be my takeaway. I would imagine as well that your experience is, is just that, it's your experience and that each person as they're going through uh, has, an, has their own level of a journey that they, uh, that they encounter. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to equate them all to be the same would be a rather challenge, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, it wasn't lost at me at the time, the, the unique uh, privilege you could say of being a, a physician parent, but, mm -hmm. but also a little bit of, uh, of a curse um, maybe not curse, but th there's some downsides to that. Um, you know, we all have different experiences and worries um, and, and ways. Uh, I, I think I, I was more forgiving of the team at times uh, and less forgiving at other times, more worried, less, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, I was very mindful to um, not let it be known most often that uh, I was a physician in training because then it would change the conversation for Trisha and for our family. And I truly believe that um, we, 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 I wanted the, the same care as, um, as everybody else. Okay. And uh, I, I didn't want things to change uh, because of a certain title or, or privilege. What a great reminder to give us. Why don't you, why don't you keep us going? Okay. Can you take us on to the, the next portion of your story this evening? Okay, let me uh, screen share again. Okay. Um, can everybody see that? Can you see yes, that yes. okay, Erna? Yes. 
Okay. So, um, uh, so now we're going to talk about moving forward again. Um, when we came home at the beginning of November, uh, I was off from all responsibilities and training, um, you know, through the Christmas holidays. Uh, and as we hit January, started thinking of um, how to return and what to return to. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a picture of of me on a long road with some hills and maybe mountains ahead, but a more accurate picture would be this. Um, because it's, you know, it's not just me returning. Uh, it's Trisha and I returning to what was our life. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this picture really sums up um, how we felt together. Because uh, individually, uh, I wouldn't be here. Um, yeah. Um, and and what, what made sense to, to Trish and I was probably th three key things. Um, we uh, we asked Callum to trust us, trust the doctors, to understand that uh, we would say to him, and he would say back to us, um, that I have to get sick to get better, right, Daddy? I I need this medicine that'll make me sick to try and be better. Um, so to ask that of him. For the time that we did, it's now, despite the fact that every everyone would say, how do you get out of bed? Well, now it's our turn for not six months, but 60 years. And there's, there's no opting out of that um, as far as we were concerned. Um, Trisha at the very beginning certainly gave me permission to to fail at medicine or, or not even go back if I didn't feel I was up for it. Um, so that made trying a lot easier. You know, that sort of, we will figure it out together, um, <clears throat> which is number three there. Um, that That's, that's really... Um, you know, the more, most important things that uh, we needed of each other. And so slowly, uh, by the end of January, I, um, I started going back to emergency medicine. And honestly, in the first couple shifts, uh, I'd go back just an hour or two at a time and see one or two or three or four patients, um, check in with the attending physician and, uh, just really baby steps. And then, and then over time, developed a little more capacity um, to see patients, to care for patients, uh, to realize that if I uh, was going to transition back, that I had to take on all the roles required of an emergency room physician. So that includes leader. Um, you need to be put together enough to think and lead and work with the team. Uh, and that takes time. Um, but uh, coming from a wonderful family, my, you know, my emergency medicine family uh, here at Queens, uh, that, uh, that made it easier. But it was, it was rough. Um, in May, so six months after losing Callum, I, I did go to Ottawa to write my exams. Um, I really wanted to have have that done. Um, uh, some people thought I was a bit nuts, but uh, the worst I could do was fail. Um, I knew that wasn't going to happen, or I was as close to knowing that that wasn't going to happen. Um, I was a little bit more worried about facing a two, three, or four-year-old child in respiratory distress 
who would need to be resuscitated, intubated with parents in the room um, and me being the leader, me being the emergency room physician, able to manage all of this cognitively, psychologically, uh, emotionally. Um, and sure enough, um, soon, soon after my exam, this, this exact presentation uh, was before me and um, that um, as, as proud as I was to pass my oral exams and written exams, uh, this, this test was um, more important for so many reasons. Um, after um, uh, passing this uh, child who is now stable um, off to the pediatric ICU, uh, you know, I excused myself for a few minutes and, and went and had a good cry. Um, and, uh, and then back, you know, that's all I needed was, was five minutes of, uh, uh, sad, prideful, uh, emotional, uh, ugly cry. Um, but that was the moment where I, I knew that I could do emergency medicine again. Um, and on the, while we're on the topic of crying. Um, for the next months and, and years, uh, you know, as I would walk from my parking spot uh, through the park to the hospital, uh, most days, almost every day, uh, and then less over the years, I, I would give myself uh, three or four minutes as I'm walking through the park to uh, cry and feel overwhelmed um, and just kind of let it out a little bit so that by the time I hit the concrete sidewalk uh, that surrounds the boundary of the hospital, I would tell myself, okay, it's time to go care for people. And if you're not up for it, you shouldn't be here. So, you know, park, park that for a bit. It's, it's time to care for others. Um, you know, and, and um, felt very strongly about that. I had lots of conversations with myself <laughs> on those walks. Um, and that's just the reality. That's, that's the hard part of, of trying to get, gut something out. Um, but then over, you know, the next six, six to seven years, um, I was able to come back to the roles that I had been aspiring to before Callum was sick, you know, of the emerged clinician, of uh, a teacher and sort of bedside coach of trainees, um, leading some initiatives, uh, being immersed and involved in uh, med ed research, uh, a lot in the, the simu high fidelity simulation lab. And so, um, I was starting to see um, the outcomes that I was looking for um, of, of, of achieving uh, some of those outcomes. And then uh, around 2013 or so, um, I realized that having spent all that time in isolation in the hospital and being a physician and those who know me uh, know, <laughs> know me well that um, I'm a pretty chatty guy and have a lot of different, you know, different opinions on lots of things. Um, I, I felt uh, a need to um, write some of these experiences and, and some of this journey down, both, both the hard parts at the beginning, but but uh, the second half of the book being about the the journey for the journey forward, um, and so two year two years ago, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I um, self published this this book on on Amazon. So I'm I'm gonna um, turn it back over to uh, I think Catherine. 
Damon, the, the transition back must have been so utterly overwhelming. And there's a few people who have some, some questions specifically. Um, Natalie Dimitri asks, can you tell us some of the supports that you relied on that kept you going at the most difficult time? And, and I'm going to add to that and ask specifically, were there supports from colleagues or, or were there ways that the team at work helped you? Were there any examples or things that, that stand out to you? Um, so, so certainly um, I, I have uh, said to many people that if I was uh, starting independent practice outside of where I trained, outside of my home of Queens and Kingston General Hospital, um, I'm not sure how that would have gone. The uh, yes, of course, the all of the the physicians who would help train me, and I'd been around for the last five years and co-residents, but but also the the nursing staff, the porters, the so, you know the social workers, the respiratory therapists, the chart, you know, the charge nurses. Um, some support is more active and, and quite uh, conversational and verbal and hugs and other times it's, it's touches on the shoulders, it's, um, it's looks, it's um, happy, to, happy to see you. Um, and, uh, you know, people asking about, you know, how's Trisha doing? So that, that was very important. Uh, I, I also blessed to be able to walk into uh, Dr. Flynn's office, who was the postgrad dean at the time, and just say, hi, can I, can I make an appointment to maybe chat a little bit um, to try and figure this out? And all of a sudden, I was up, upstairs and, you know, she dropped everything for an hour. I think that's a good example of um, many, many people who who did that for me, um, you know, in addition to obviously uh, family and, and close friends, uh, but, you know, we're, we're talking about returning to work. And so that was, um, that was really important to have multiple, multiple different support networks, some more active, some more passive, but just that, that collective community that, you know, is just one big sort of, hug or circle or around me that that had my back uh, it was it was palpable to me and there's a really lovely comment well there's a number of lovely comments in the chat but you, so justin speaks and, and talks about this and i don't know if this strikes resonance with you he says it strikes me that we have very limited insight into the inner lives of those around us and he shares a personal story about you as his mentor is there any comments on that just in, in terms of you know sharing your own story and, and you know those working with as, a, as an educator as well with students um there's a lot to unpack there um you know i i so one justin thank thank you for that um two i i think i think um Sometimes it's not until years in the future that you realize how other people have had an impact uh, on you, whether it's during training or, or other times. Um, and that, uh, you know, role, role modeling and, and trying to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Um, I, I'm not sure I know any other way how to be other than I am. I appreciate that um, I sometimes share more than the average person or um, uh, sometimes feel more comfortable sharing things. My, my father, who is also an eMERGE physician, um, you know, has, has said to me, commented, you know, uh, you know, Damon, I worry about you um, putting yourself out there. Uh, how are you not more self-conscious? Well, I am, I'm plenty self-conscious, uh, but uh, when everybody knows that the worst thing in your life has happened to you, it's no, there's no secret there that our, our, we lost our child to cancer. And um, sometimes you just have to show up and, and the, 
the showing up and, and, and trying part um, is the part. Uh, didn't know it at the time, but uh, you know, as, as things get easier and work through, I realized that the, the, the trying part, as I said, you know, that guiding philosophy of those three things and, and Damon, you're going to touch on this, and this will be the last comment I pull um, from the chat before we, we end in your next um, part. Um, Barry Sho Barney Schoelfield comments, how did you stop the medical caring for others taking over the job of looking after yourself and your family? And I think you're going to talk about that in the next little bit, in, but just so, commenting on here. So I think, I think what I'm hearing is... Um, you know, being a being a parent and a husband and not the doctor of my child is that am I interpreting Bernie's comment right? That's how I see it too. Okay, so um, I write about this a little bit in my book along with other stories. But uh, when we were in the preoperative uh, room with Callum uh, about to go into a six to eight to ten hour uh, neurosurgery. Um, as I was escorting Callum to the operating room with the team, I tearfully said to the anesthetist, um, don't worry, I'll be good. Like, I'll, like I'll, I'll, keep my, I'll keep it together um, as we go into the operating room. And um, <laughs> she, she kind of stopped in the hallway and put her hand on my shoulder and, and said to me, no, you won't. And you, you, and she said, "No, you, you won't be, um, because you shouldn't be." Um, she said, "You know, you, you are now, dad, you are husband, um, and that's it." And um, you know, people had phoned into pre-op other physicians sort of wish, wishing us well. And that was quite lovely. And she said, I know that you're, you know, a physician in training. And she said, she said, you, you are dad and husband now and, mm -hmm. and be that and be that. And so I know she was saying it in the moment, but I also felt that she was saying that going forward. Um, and, and that, that uh, really um, yeah. defined um, how I approach the next five and a half months of his illness um, and, and some of the, the um, approach uh, of, of not micromanaging the team. But, but yes, of, of course, being a physician and being aware of some of the patient safety issues and, and being able to speak healthcare doctor language uh, when I felt, uh, or even coaching Trisha uh, when we, we felt uh, something needed to be dealt with. Uh, didn't do it perfectly, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, and uh, you know, a, a lot of what you're, you're, you're talk, speaking about in that transition is, is also in your comments now, just thinking about the physician as person, which really takes us to the last piece of the, the conversation you wanted to have with everybody. Okay. Um, you, we can see that okay, Catherine? Yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, so the last part um, of, of me presenting is, is uh, a few, a few important reflections um, about my journey so far. Um, and the first is this whole concept of surviving versus thriving. And, um, you know, you see all the words here, recovery and thriving and po post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic stress and resilience and functioning and time. Um, I, I could overlay this with the stages of grief uh, and um, you know, the reason I, I put this forward is I, I think all of these, these concepts are, are super important. Um, 
those of us who've had a significant loss appreciate that it can be um, <laughs> all of this at once, or, uh, you know, it, our, our, our journey and our, our recovery, if, if that's, uh, the right word, uh, is not, uh, is not linear. And, uh, you know, this graph shows a very linear <laughs> slopes and, uh, approaches, you know, you're either thriving, recovering, or succumbing, or, or what have you. And, and, and I think for, um, those of us, uh, especially early on, it is a lot more of this. It's all over and it's a storm. And, you know, the physician in me, the, the personal psychologist in me, um, my self-talk can, can try to, uh, put some order to things and, and others with good intentions can put some order to things, but it really is a storm um, of, of so many things of emotion and a, a kaleidoscope of emotion uh, and, and other things. And, and I think if we're lucky, um, trying support networks um, that gradually over time, there, there's an upward trajectory um, but even that arrow that I put there does not capture the ups and downs and forward and, and, and backward. Uh, but it's, it's a long process. And, and where am I on this arrow? Well, I mentioned before 60 years, it's been 14 years. So I, I would put myself, um, uh, you know, only a, a quarter of the way, maybe up the up the arrow uh, when I think of um, the journey that's left. The other thing that you know, I think we we spoke to in t in talking about uh, the supports at work. Uh, you know, I, I think we all know that family and friends um, uh, fundamentally important, but. But over time at, at work and through the different initiatives and busyness and stressors that I've encountered, uh, good and bad, uh, and maybe because I'm a relationship kind of person and this kind of work speaks to me a lot, um, but those connections and relationship building opportunities that we have and, you know, right now uh, would be what I would say one of those magic times of being able to sit in my living room and, and make a connection with, with so many people uh, who, are, who are here right now. Um, but whether it's work, whether it's home, whether it's family, um, a lot of those connections after tragic circumstance need to be reconnected and maybe in different ways and building on relationships. And, um, you know, I've, uh, uh, gotten much better at apologizing and um, saying when um, I went left and maybe now that I think about it I should have gone right or a little more left um, but that connections we have with each other and, and as I feel a little sort of stronger with time how, how to create more opportunities for connection and relationship building uh, amongst you know us as, as healthcare workers um, really really speaks speaks to me and then I, I'm going to end on on this one, um, and talk about being a, you know, I'm a physician, so I'm going to talk about physician identity a little bit uh, in these last few moments. This this um, figure is the the Can Meds framework. It is the the flower with sort of the expert at the middle and the the surrounding petals. Uh, and you know, I think it was about 30 years ago that. Um, some of the, the foundational work um, started to um, ask different groups of patients and families and advocates and healthcare workers and physicians, what is it that um, people need of physicians? Um, and and um, you know, this has evolved over time. And uh, you know, this is an internationally recognized framework um, outside of Canada and something we're quite proud of. Uh, and is a big part of the identity through medical training of 
really internalizing these roles and, and wanting to provide these roles for, for patients and families. But um, one thing that uh, I feel in my experience and my journey um, and, and just working as, as a physician is that the, the, the physician as person, I need, uh, I, I need as, a, as a physician on my side of the bed for patients and families and healthcare team members to see me as a person um, with imperfections and expertise and, and everything else. Um, and I need my colleagues who are also physicians to see me as a person and, and see them as a person. Uh, you know, I felt strongly this way before our global pandemic and I, and I feel like we're, we're starting to have some of these conversations I've been um, uh, really excited to have with other colleagues about um, the human element of our sort of dual roles of being a physician and a person caring for people, but also needing to be cared for in the moment. Uh, and so, um, you know, traditionally, uh, th this has been incorporated within the, the flower petals. And so as we go forward, uh, something that I want to explore and I've done a little bit of writing about is have, have we come to a point to, to pull this out and, and make it more explicit um, and, and not necessarily change the framework itself, but complement the framework with, you know, I have your, um, you know, a STEM um, that, that, Kind of is the root of um, underneath of of the flower and the and the petals, um, and the last thing I'll say to this is that you know that I, I'm speaking as a physician, but um, person centered care and and caring for others. Um, we're healthcare professionals and advocates. Uh, together. So it's, it's, I use the physician example in the framework that um, I'm most a part of, uh, but I, but I do think it's relevant and which is why, you know, I, I, the, the title of this talk is, is doctor as person. Um, because this is what I bring to um, the bedside. Um, and it's not lost on me that this picture best represents what it is that I'm most proud of um, in that what I do and the relationship, the connection um, and the privilege that I have in being with somebody else, caring for somebody else while they are vulnerable and in pain and in needing comfort and care, and yes, medical expertise and other things. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think this is a true for, for all of us. It's not a physician patient issue. It is a, it is a, a healthcare professional patient, uh, family uh, and person oriented uh, perspective. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, I, that I feel like I, I kind of um, uh, gave you a little bit of a, a pitch at the end. So my, my apologies if I got a little carried away. Um, but here's, here's my Christmas card this year um, of, of my family. Af after we lost uh, Callum, um, we uh, had a daughter as well. And so uh, my son is now 18 on the right hand side there. Uh, you can't see my, well, you can see my white hair video here, but um, um, you know, that, that's us. I, I uh, despite a tough first part of this talk, I, I am a very blessed person uh, with a very, with many privileges and um, being here with you um, now uh, it's not lost on me what a what a fantastic privilege that is. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, for coming, and I I hope that many of you can stay so that we can keep uh, talking over the next half hour. And I'll I'll now zip it and uh, let us move. Let us. Thank you, Damon.
Thank you. That's wonderful. I mean, it, it, as you know, um, the topic of being person-centered is very near and dear to my heart. But what I'll acknowledge is that in order for us to flourish, then all persons in the context of practice matter. And when all persons are taken into consideration, then the humanity of the care and the work that we're doing will all come forward. So you've, you've nicely tied it together to remember all persons, whether they be the patient or the provider or the family or the cleaner that's in the hospital, we all play that role to give the care that we need. Um, what a great way, I think, to have an evening uh, of conversation and questioning. And I know we said an hour, but uh, we're able to stay on for another half an hour. And so I understand if people need to leave, it is the end of the day. Um, but if you would like to hang out with us for a little bit longer and have further conversation, uh, we welcome you to stay. I uh, want to remind everybody that, um, you know, there's more to come. Our next two coming sessions, one on November 18th with Rosemary Wilson. Rosemary is going to talk with us about chronic pain care at the front lines, perhaps something again near and dear to all of our hearts. And then on December 16th, uh, Jane Philpott, our new dean, is going to discuss navigating the detours in career and life. So we certainly welcome you to come to that. But before we go into our Fun a little bit if you're able to stay with us for conversation. I'm just going to turn you uh, back to one of our hosts who just wants to have a brief little end of the session conversation. I'm confident about something he'd like you to complete. So Terry, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Erin. Uh, much appreciated. And Damon and Catherine, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for being our moderators. Um, so one of the best ways that our attendees can help us with our continued work in humanity and healthcare is with completing the post-program survey, which is also the fastest way to a CME certificate uh, for those that want it that way. Um, it also gives us feedback and suggestions for the kinds of topics that the health and humanities, or sorry, the, the humanities and healthcare team uh, is gonna be planning sessions going forward. So I'll pop that into the chat and Michaela is also gonna send it along to you a little bit later on uh, this evening for you to complete. So uh, without any further ado, I won't take any any more of your time and pass it back to our esteemed moderators. Awesome. Thanks, Terry.